Okay, well, the clock says 8.30. Um, I want to say hi, P to everybody this morning. Thank you for joining us. I um, want to, I guess, uh, introducing myself to begin with. Uh, my name is Amy LaPointe, and I'm the Education Director for the Winnebago Tribe. i uh, been in my position for almost four years, and uh, one of the jobs or tasks of my job is to Hold an education summit. Um, I came on soon, you know, around the pandemic time, and um, we had a. Uh, I guess had, I'm kind of nervous here, but um, had planned a summit to be in person uh, a couple years ago, and then we had to delay it. And um, that last time was like three days, and. Um, Wanted to keep the going um, got support from uh, the University of Nebraska. So they're a huge partner in um, what's going on today. So I want to say thank, thank them. Um, I don't know if Nat, uh, Nancy's on yet, but um, just want to say thank you to uh, helping me uh, make this happen. I want to say thank you to all the um, presenters and um, we're going to start the morning off with a uh, welcome and blessing. I have uh, Lorelai Decora. She serves on our Winnebago Tribal Council. Um, I don't know how many years she can kind of do a, a introduction of herself. I'll turn it over to you, Lorelai. Thank you, Amy. I want to say thank you to all our, our educators. Um, that are um, talking today together. Um, I'm always amazed and I really respect people that work very hard so the rest of us can learn throughout our whole lifetime. And so I wanna welcome all of you to today's session. And I wanna say I'm really grateful for this beautiful morning uh, today, across our country, we celebrate the beautiful teachings brought to us by the Indigenous peoples of North America. And as a Winnebago tribal member, I'm very proud to be an Indigenous person. I'm thankful that I was born an Indigenous person. So I want to just offer a prayer so that we have Mauna, God's guidance today as we discuss these various issues 
and we learn together so that tomorrow we can go back into what we do as educators and learners all ready and fired up to go. So I'm gonna offer a prayer in my own mind and I ask you all to uh, bear with me, okay? Okay, I would thank you, and I hope we all have a good day. Turn it back over to you, Amy. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I have, so the agenda for this morning, I'm not sure if everybody's seen um, the flyer, but we have uh, a couple of keynote speakers uh, from uh, Diana Knoyer, she's going to be speaking at nine o'clock uh, around um, Indian Education for All. She is the executive director of uh, National Indian Ed Association. And then um, at 10 a.m., we'll have uh, Michelle Lemire uh, talking about the immersion classroom that she's doing and uh, Weetha Aldridge about curriculum development. And then um, 11 o'clock, there'll be time in between for question and answer. So they'll be presenting and then at the end, there'll be time for um, to answer questions if there's any. Uh, 11 o'clock, we'll have um, Brenda Hunter Murphy and Dalberta Frazier from the Omaha Nation Public School um, talking about their outdoor classroom. And then we'll break for lunch. Um, and come back at one o'clock. Uh, we have uh, another keynote speaker, Tanea Winder. Um, she's a really good speaker. Uh, heard her at a conference uh, a few months back. And then um, we will hear from Memphis Justo from Santee Public Schools. Um, she's gonna talk about the leadership program that uh, she's enrolled in right now. And then we'll end the day with uh, Barbara Butte. She's with the Department of Ed, um, talking about the travel consultation guide. Um, and then wrap, wrap up. Uh, I'm not sure if Diana's on, but if she's not, um, we could probably just wait around for a little bit. I'm here. Oh, are you? Okay. Yes. So maybe we'll just get started a little earlier. Um, oh, okay. Since we're, um, and then maybe we'll end early. So um, I know that uh, Diana just came off of the big uh, NIEA conference last week. So I'm really thankful. I, I can imagine that you're pretty exhausted. <laughs> uh, it was a wonderful conference. Um, I truly enjoyed myself and the theme. Um, a few weeks back, we had a kickoff event for Winnebago looking at how we could develop our own native teachers in Winnebago. And um, so a lot of the sessions that I attended, it was around that, what um, other programs are doing mm -hmm. in, their, in their program, in their schools and stuff to do that. So um, I got a lot of information, uh, but it, yeah, I just wanna, uh, Diana, uh, she, uh, I'll read her bio on the flyer in case anybody didn't see it but through her passion and enthusiasm for supporting native students diana has been a key driver in expanding niea's work beyond beyond the halls of the u.s capitol to communities across indian country she has helped shape broader teacher hiring initiatives created more opportunities for, for visits to tribal communities acquired millions in grant funding for niea testified before the U.S. Congress in support of Native education and an inspired professional trust and collaboration among staff, colleagues, organizations, and Native nations across the country. Her work has ensured that Native students have the best possible outcomes and educators have the best possible resources to support their efforts. Knoyer directs the staff in carrying out the organization's 
strategic plan, which includes advocacy, building tribal education capacity, culture-based education, skilled teachers and leaders, establishing educational standards, assessments and accountability, and post-secondary success. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Diana. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Amy. I'm sorry I missed you at the convention. It would have been nice to give you a good hug and welcome you to Oklahoma. Ihane Wash Day relatives, and thank you for joining today. Uh, those that have the day off, thank you for joining this Zoom call. Those that are at work, thank you for taking time um, to walk away and <clears throat> join this conversation. I don't want to take too much of your time and, and speak at you. I wanted this to be a conversation. Um, it is a wonderful day to be Indigenous. Sorry, allergies in my dry throat. It's a wonderful day to be Indigenous. And I do want to acknowledge today is Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, somebody told me uh, a while ago, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. And I just have to laugh because it's like a Thanksgiving or Christmas or happy, uh, happy day, a happy event. So I wanted to say that I've been reflecting on while the country acknowledges us today, let's remind them that every day is Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you, Amy. I wanna thank the Winnebago Tribe Education Department. I wanna thank University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the College of Education and Human Services for this opportunity to speak today. I also wanna acknowledge the Spencer Foundation, a great and wonderful partner. Um, across research, but also across Indian country, we've been able, we've been blessed with the Spencer Foundation grant in the past. <clears throat> I do want to also acknowledge that we did have a, an amazing convention. Um, I think every year it has a, um, a set of special events that we celebrate in Omaha. It was a beautiful space. It was the, you know, first face-to-face um, non-virtual convention that we were able to come together, which made it a unique year, convention year. This time in Oklahoma City, um, <clears throat> as, as we open up from the pandemic and we begin to travel a little bit more and um, maybe folks are feeling a little bit safer, you know, it was a larger convention year. It was the year of education sovereignty. Um, we Every year is education sovereignty, but we wanted to acknowledge that this is the year as you come out of a pandemic or a global health crisis. We wanted everyone to know that we're still here, that although a global health crisis took place, we were still thriving as Native communities. You were still thriving as educators, as parents, as community members, as elders, whatever your role was, you were still ensuring that your students felt heard, felt loved. Um, we're learning, sharing knowledge with each other and with you and your community. <clears throat> in my reflection for today, but also my reflection uh, uh, over the past week, and in front of what I said, this is a conversation. I know I'm speaking at you. I want it to be that I want to speak with you. I begin to conduct my own research on origin stories and indigenous knowledge, language, across all of our histories. And I focused on languages that are written, the Oglalas, or sorry, the Lakota, the Dakota, Nakota, that's my community, the, the different language groups, um, the Ojibwe, languages that were written that I had access to online. And what I was looking for was a definition of education, or was there a word? for education, the colonized word, E-D-U-C-A-T-I-O-N. Does that translate into our languages? Is there a direct translation? And what I found that the word education simply doesn't exist in our languages. What exists in our languages are descriptors and actions like share, knowledge, observe, compassion, generosity, wisdom, practice. There was not a direct translation for the um, English word of education. And I found that really odd, but I also found it profound. 
because over the last 50 years, we've developed education systems around national standards that have been given to us. They've been defined for us. The way that we thought was teaching or learning and sharing was stripped from us. Native communities continued to struggle. And what was the root cause? The root cause is we have literally been lost in translation. What we understood as learning and sharing in wisdom wasn't defined the same way in this American education system. The delivery of education, the delivery of knowledge was redefined for us. <clears throat> we were told how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, and what to learn. Our way of learning has been disrupted, and we've been out of balance ever since. <clears throat> We have balance when our communities share teachings through storytelling, when our communities share teachings through observation, through trial and error. We're grounded in our community values, practice, cultural thought, and philosophy. What this recent global pandemic has uncovered for a lot of Native communities is we have the power to change the education paradigm. We had to figure out how to continue sharing knowledge and information with our students when state, local, and federal education system support systems failed us. I see from Omaha's convention and Oklahoma's convention coming out of a pandemic, we are unwilling to stand still when our youth and community are seeking change for, to meet the basic needs. <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, our innovation and resilience are actually true expressions of who we are as people and developing sustainable best practices during crises, not only for our native communities, but also for our non-native students and the surrounding non-native communities. I heard many stories, not just of vaccines from IHS and um, native health facilities being offered to non-native folks, but even our education systems public schools on reservations that serve non-native students, still including those non-native students. We never exclude anyone, but we are constantly excluded in the system itself. We are in a new era of native education that's empowered through tribal sovereignty, self-governance, and the actualization of the impact of our indigenous thought and philosophy, our learning models that focus on sharing, observing through compassion, generosity, and wisdom. This practice is the right to choose how our students learn. This is actually education sovereignty. Over 50 years, NIA has been charged with working on your behalf, on Native students' behalfs, on Native community behalfs, <clears throat> to be your voice in the halls of Congress with administrations and regulatory bodies. Our mission has since evolved and expanded, never changing, but growing to include the development and implementation of programs and services that directly impact communities and students. We have increased our development of instructional services and our impact on local and national education providers. <clears throat> we have invested in online professional development in response to a global health crisis when we could not see each other physically share space we ensured that any challenges that come about similar to a global health crisis, we can still continue to share and learn knowledge. We have expanded our partnerships for growing our own education pathways. We are establishing a community-based education model that serves and supports tribal education systems to build their own education capacity and outreach. In this year, what I'm calling the year of education sovereignty, I wanna bring light to all the work that native communities have done. Whether you're in a tribal community, on a reservation, a public school that serves a combination of native and non-native students, or you're in a urban, a large urban center. I wanna bring about the conversation that you, used your own cultural knowledge, your own ways, your own community to ensure that your students were not lost, were not forgotten and continued to grow. NIA has expanded its legislative team 
to advance policy and regulatory priorities, specifically called out from the global pandemic. We want to ensure that local to national uh, <clears throat> federal agencies understand what your role is as, as community members. We've established a tribal state policy staff position in response to this overwhelmingly high attacks on tribal history and culture in the classroom. To support all of your work, we've also invested internally to develop and retain data sovereignty <clears throat> through a research and evaluation staff position. This position is ready to work collaboratively with partners and tribes to collect data and determine how the data will impact our tribal and state work. <clears throat> from our communities, we heard the impacts, challenges, and successes as we er emerged from the pandemic. And we did find an opportunity for us to shape the future of what native education could look like. For centuries, we've operated under a system that is fueled by fear the fear of lack of resources and funding, the fear of culture being stripped from our schools, the fear of backlash from a system of oppression that has lasted too long. As we move into another school year, let's move towards a system that does not include the word fear. Let's empower ourselves through the word yes. Yes, we can do anything. Yes, we are still here. Yes, we can partner and hold the White House, the BIE, the Department of Interior and the Department of Education responsible for their federal trust responsibilities. Yes, we are continuing to develop culturally responsive curriculum in spite of uh, CRT, in spite of state house bills or Senate bills being passed. And we are working with state and local lawmakers to ensure that the implementation of native curriculum history and culture is included in our school system. Yes, we are supporting title programs, tribal schools, charter schools, immersion schools, and BIE schools, because education sovereignty to us is the right to choose what is best for our students. Yes, we are gonna to continue to work with Congress on appropriations for all of these programs to ensure that they continue, but they thrive. And yes, the diversification of funding in Native education is critical. And with the support from partners, philanthropists, we are able to supplement these needs for our most vulnerable communities. <clears throat> it is now time to change the path and to take next steps to ensure that our children do thrive by supporting the whole child. This is another initiative that NIA has established and we launched at convention this year, the Whole Child Initiative. This will include social emotional learning, prevention and uh, mental health curriculum for schools. It will not be a supplement, it will be, uh, it will be built into school systems. NIA is establishing a model that we can pick up and pilot in any school. <clears throat> As I said in the beginning, it is the best time to be indigenous in this country. It is the best time to keep moving forward and taking this momentum and growing with progress. Resistance works to a certain degree, but persistence works 100% of the time. And we have to be persistent for our students, for our communities and for future children. Through our indigenous knowledge, we have already changed the world. I believe this 100%. So the next steps are actually in our hands. What do we want to do and how do we want to show up? I appreciate, Amy, the opportunity to visit with you guys this morning. And uh, I saw your agenda and you're carrying out this uh, philosophy of education sovereignty and what it means to create your own learning systems and sharing your own knowledge. Thank you all again. And Amy, I'm happy to stay on and take questions or, as I said, have a conversation. <clears throat> Diana, that was awesome. Um, yeah, I, a theme I heard, you know, through keynotes I've been to, which is uh, the JOM conference. Um, another, but just that we need to be work together. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think at even at NIEA, you know, that 
we're stronger when we work together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can't be done on your own. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel that, that message so much. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Diana um, regarding, you know, what she, she spoke about. Um, or or share a story. Or story. have a story. Um, what are you doing help? in your community? <clears throat> what are you most proud of? What do you want me to come and visit? I love to visit communities, but I never like to impose. So I have to have an invitation. Diana, do um, does NIEA have like um, any type of special actions that they take in order to increase the number of indigenous teachers? Yes, we have an educator initiative that right now it's unfunded, so it's a minimal project. We're seeking partners and and, um, grant funds, but it's an initiative that focuses on getting down into the high school level and creating those pathways for folks that are in, you know, wanting to leave high school and go into college into a teacher prep program. So it's changing the marketing, changing the communications, Uh, developing recruitment pathways for high school students or paras that are currently working in the education system, and then how to retain teachers. So through our own data and research, we realized a lot of our teachers leave the education system within five to eight years after they start, and they've moved around from system to system. But most often what we're hearing is their lack of professional development in the school the lack of support from school leadership and administration. And there was a third one in lack of housing for some of our tribal MBIE systems. So the two areas that NIA can work on is supporting professional development, helping schools structure a professional development system so that all teachers feel supported. Number two, we're working on systems where superintendents and school boards or school leaders understand how do you share your value? How do you demonstrate support? Not just professional learning opportunities, but how do you support your teachers when they're struggling? These are all pilot programs that we're happy to come and implement in schools. We also have one pagers and <clears throat> some training, some training resources, but Unfortunately, that school leadership needs to accept that they're the ones that are creating some of those um, retention challenges. <laughs> we we had, like I said, that kickoff event a couple of weeks ago, or probably six weeks ago or so. Um, we brought the tribal college. We brought um, Jade from the school. Um, we had tri- different programs attend and um, kind of brainstorm some ideas. We even had a former teacher uh, present to us. Um, and a lot of uh, his comment was around um, the same things, but also, you know, the teacher pay. We know that teachers are mm-hmm. underpaid for the amount of work that they do. Um, and, you know, it's not just the one one meeting and we're done. Uh, we plan to meet every other month to come out with a real plan, such as that path, hoping, you know, it's a pathway. We have the apprenticeship program. Um, we have, I think, two current students that um, come down here to Educare. Um, mm-hmm. that. That's the early childhood. Um, we have one, I think, that works with the PE teacher at the school. Mm-hmm. Um, but more meaningful towards, you know, education. So if they're interested in becoming a teacher, how can we be more supportive and get them those resources? You know, that's the goal um, to really brainstorm together how we can create this and and be sustainable, I guess. Um, And it takes time, you know, I, I think a lot of the stuff, if you really do it and you're meaningful in it, 
it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time and commitment, you know, mm-hmm. from, from people and, um, you know, trying to get the resources and all of that. So, but it can be done, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, that, it's yes, you know, um, if you really put in the work and the effort, it can be done. So can yeah. I attend one of those meetings and listen? Sure. sure. Yep. Um, we're probably next month is our next one. We, okay. Um, we're just thinking every other month. So November sometime. And okay. Anyone's welcome. Um, once we get that time and set up, um, the notes okay. that we took, you know, over what we did, um, go over those and then kind of what our next step is too. So, yeah. Any okay. other questions? And we are, yeah, we're kind of early, Michelle, you're, <laughs> you're up next, so like an hour early. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, and, uh, oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, we can get you out early and, and you go play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I see a note. I see a chat that came up. I'm sorry. Okay. One chat. Brenda. Okay. Yes, I would love to visit your outdoor classroom in Macy. Is this Brenda Murphy? Yeah, she'll be okay. presenting too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I partner with, hi, Brenda. Good morning. Good morning. I partner with the Green Schools Network. Um, it's a national nonprofit, and they're looking to, uh, <clears throat> similar to what you're doing and, and what you're implementing, they're looking to create environmentally friendly schools, like those LED schools, lead schools, but they're also looking to support this outdoor classroom uh, in a cultural manner. They do work out in the Zuni community and the uh, Jemez community in New Mexico, and they're trying to expand their reach across um, public schools that are on reservations or high native public schools that are in urban areas. So I would love to visit your program and then introduce you to the leadership of the Green Schools Network. That'd be wonderful, thank you. <clears throat> Just let me know when you want me to start. Yeah, maybe um, we'll take uh, a couple minute break if anyone okay. water or use the restroom. Um, Diana, before mm-hmm. you, I just, or you can welcome to stay on too, but mm-hmm. I just want to say thank you so much um, for taking the time this morning. Like I said, I know that <laughs> but I had to take a lot of effort last week. Everything was amazing. <laughs> and I know that that's hard work that gets put into all of that. Um, so thank you for joining us on Indigenous Peoples Day. It was It's a beautiful day. Thank you so much, Amy, for the invite. And two final plugs. Those of you who are interested in learning about advocacy, uh, our Hill Week is March 5th. I want to say 5th through the 7th. I might be wrong on those dates, but it's that week in March. Come to D.C., Washington, D.C. We go, we put you through an Advocacy 101, and then we walk you into the halls of Congress sit with you and we meet with staffers, we meet with some congressional representatives, and this is an opportunity to advocate what's going on in your state, on your tribal community, in your school. And then our convention next year, I'm already starting to plug that, is in Albuquerque, um, October 15th or 18th through the 21st. And invite me to your communities, share what you're working on, share your struggles, share your successes, um, would love to continue to highlight the, the amazing work that's not just in the Winnebago community, but all the communities that are in Nebraska. So thank you again, Amy. It's always good to see you. Sorry I didn't get to hug you. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about we come back? It's 9.05 or 9.02. Um, maybe about 9.20, Michelle? Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. Yep. Bye-bye. All right, we're on break till 920.
920. Um, welcome back. Uh, our next speakers are um, from Winnebago and they're Michelle Lemire. Uh, I'll read her bio. Michelle Lemire is a member of the Wolf Clan of the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska and a descendant in the Malax Band of Ojibwe. She earned an AA in early childhood education from Little Priest Tribal College and a teaching degree in elementary education with the emphasis in linguistics from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Michelle is currently the project development specialist at the Ho Chunk Renaissance Language and Culture Program. Michelle also is also the lead teacher in Horaki. How do you say it? Horaki. <laughs> Horaki. The Ho-Chunk Language Academy, a dual language classroom located in the Winnebago Public School. Through the years, Michelle has also taught many classes in Native American ethnobotany in the region. Her students range from preschoolers to elders. Her classes are very popular and include studying plants in the field, making medicine, survival skills, crafts, and harvesting sustainability. She was also a social and environmental activist. Um, so we'll have Michelle go first, and then um, we also have uh, Letha Aldrich um, who will go after Michelle, and she's um, presenting. On, she was the uh, curriculum development specialist and was developing um, Ho Chunk curriculum for uh, K through four. So um, she'll talk a little bit about what she done. Um, after Michelle. So I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay. Um, we know. I am my students, um, they refer to me as Wagi Goose Nieja. And um, that's kind of reflective of uh, the philosophy of how we're planning our classroom. Um, I believe Diana alluded to it before where, um, when she said that um, indigenous teaching was different um, than modern day teaching. And a part of that was um, that the, the instructors, the teachers of the children were all people that they knew, people they were related to. Um, the teaching was relationship-based, and that's how we have structured our classroom. Our children refer to us by the relationship they have with us. So if we, are, if we have any relatives in the classroom, uh, they usually refer to us by that relation. Um, I have one, one child in there that she is my actual niece, but she refers to me as Wagi Goose. And then I have another child in there who is um, kind of a, an extended family relation. She refers to me as uh, Gaga. So it, it just depends on how that child sees you as, um, as to how they refer to you. And that was a huge, a huge, I guess, philosophy when it came to putting the classroom together. And in order to plan the, the curriculum and design the whole classroom, we had to think about what it was that we wanted to gain. And in order to think about what we wanted to gain, we had to think about what we lost so far. And we just like it says, we know how this story goes, how the children were taken. Their homes were taken from them their language, their clothing was stripped from them, their hair was cut, their spirituality became banned, their culture, every part of their culture was banned, their identity was stripped from them. The schools were located hundreds of miles away from the nearest reservation or the nearest indigenous community on purpose. It was intentional in order to break those family structures. Um, their resiliency was taken from them, their strength and their connection, not only to their people, but to their land. And as a result, they had the loss of culture and the communication. Um, what was left after their identities and everything else was stripped for them was depression, shame, 
no knowledge of their cultural or traditional practices. And one that still prevails today is the negative attitude towards education. And um, we see that even in our classroom with the attendance problems, um, education isn't prioritized the way it would be in other cultures. Um, there's also a negative attitude towards the indigenous spirituality where maybe a child that's born a little or raised a little more traditionally might you know, suffer some teasing or what have you, or children um, reject any type of spiritual um, ceremonies or traditions. And that pretty much re is reflected in negative attitude towards anything traditional because that's what the children were taught. They were taught that anything indigenous was bad, was evil, was uh, negative. Um, they also had to suffer from the negative effects of racism, which we, through modern research, they found that it does have um, psychological, physical, and physiological effects. So the effects of racism does have an effect on academic achievement. Um, also as a result of uh, what the children went through is alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, um, all those things that lead to MMIW and also the loss of matriarchal roles. Uh, the church um, instilled that belief that women shouldn't do this, women shouldn't do that, women should stay home and women shouldn't speak. And so there were a lot of matriarchal roles that were lost as well. And so uh, while I was in school, I was approached by Louis St. Cyr and he offered me um, this proposal to teach this classroom. And he said, I would have to design it from scratch, come up with everything, including a mission and goals and curriculum research. And it seemed like a, a worthy challenge, so I took it. And uh, in my research, I came across a man named Stephen Biko, who had a lot of uh, a lot of teachings, a lot of uh, speakings about black consciousness. And the thing that I took away the most from that was that the black children that he knew and that he how he grew up, when they opened the books in the schools, all the heroes, all the the leaders were all white people. When they turn on the TV, all the heroes were white people. When they read children's books, nobody in the books looked like them. And after a while, the children would start to grow up thinking there was something inherently wrong with them because they didn't look like anybody that they saw in a positive manner. Um, so in order to reverse that type of thinking, um, Stephen Biko, um, I guess he promoted black consciousness and he promoted having black people in their history books, teaching black history, teaching um, about their, their own culture. And instead of having uh, things given to them, they had to, he thought it would be best for the children if the black people provided it for themselves. Also, I did a lot of research on the Hawaiian language um, revitalization. And, you know, there was a lot of things that they were doing that I thought would be good for our classroom, like um, indigenous language across the curriculum, using it as much as possible throughout the day, using indigenous educators and trying to get more family involvement and community collaboration, which is turning out to be the, our biggest asset and using indigenous history, science, music, and using land-based education, which is also turning out to be pretty, pretty successful. And also maintaining that spiritual con connection because you cannot have the identity without that connection. And the plan was to um, get the children in the first grade we observed kids in kindergarten and 
We handpicked the children that showed the most proficiency in during the Ho-Chunk language classes and also had the best um, language ability. So we picked 12, 12 students, nine of them said yes. And we got them in the first grade. And for the time being, we're gonna keep them through the third grade. And on that third year, we'll reevaluate and see whether or not we're gonna keep them longer. And we're gonna teach, Ho -Chunk. we taught Ho-Chunk language 10% of the time last year during that first year. During this year, our goal is by the end to have to be teaching or speaking in the language 50% of the time. And by the end of the third year, 90% of the time. It probably will never be 100% because there's so many things that won't translate from English to Ho-Chunk. Um, the lead teacher, that would be me. I was the one that, to develop the research curriculum lessons and to teach in the classroom. And I specifically asked for two language paraeducators, one male and one female. And the reason for that is so that we could have modeling, um, social modeling, as well as langu language modeling, and one fluent speaker. We have him, uh, we have access to him throughout the day. Um, I also wanted traditional clothing to be worn as much as possible to normalize indigenous clothing. Um, like we saw in those first slides, the clothing was stripped from them first. That was the first thing that went. And I guess growing up, you, you think of people in traditional clothing as that's only worn during, during power time. And if you see anybody wearing it uh, beyond that, it's, oh, they're just trying to be super, super native or whatever. And we wanted to try to turn that into something positive so that when the children see somebody in traditional clothing, they see um, not just an authority figure, but somebody who cares for them, somebody um, who passes knowledge to them, who um, is a positive, a positive role model in their lives, so that when they see that traditional clothing, it's something positive. And also, we're hoping to have uh, Ho-Chunk. Renaissance provide language classes for each family unit um, representative of each student in the class. And there are a lot of educational opportunities, a lot of resources online and through books that the families can utilize. And the most important part is that we wanted to collaborate with other programs and other community members. And so far we've had uh, programs and community members provide uh, the buckskin for the moccasins or the elk hides. Uh, we've had people hired and volunteered to provide traditional clothing for the children. Um, at this age, though, they grow fast. They grow out of those things so fast. So if um, clothing comes in fitting just right, it'll probably fit them for about five minutes before they grow out of it. We also went through and identified five core values that we will, that we have been teaching the children. And we try to incorporate those values in, you know, every part of our day. Um, if we recognize something that they did that um, pertains to any of these core values, then we'll, we'll talk about it and we'll point it out to them. And our goal is so that the children will learn to make their own decisions and think critically, not only about their own behavior, but about um, how they are treated so that they will learn how to stand up for themselves, to speak for themselves and to um, encourage each other as well. And we developed a culture curriculum. Our curriculum is the one on the right. The one on the left was developed by the Indian Community School. And when I saw that, I tried, I tried to make one just like that, not just like that. I wanted to try to make one similar um, without copying theirs, and I couldn't do it. And I finally um, asked the officials at the Indian Community School if we could just copy their, their model. And they said, sure, go ahead and you know, take whatever you want. All our resources are there for you. So um, we created the, the one on the right based on Ho-Chunk uh, names for the seasons as well as the names for the months of the year. 
and um, below that are are the five core values that we alternate and rotate through. And after that are the practices that happen during those times of the year. So if you look in the dulk, the summertime, it will say celebrations to earth, customs and traditions, living in a good way. And those are, we can find um, lessons that we could create based on those. And there's also specific cultural practices that happen during that time, which is in the the inner, the ring right next to that one, including harvesting stickball, um, studying about boarding schools, powwows, historical chiefs, foraging. So a lot of those things are things that happen traditionally in the summertime. And that's pretty much how we um, came up with our cultural calendar, the format for the cultural calendar. And these are our little relatives. I refer to them as little relatives rather than students. Again, to enforce, reinforce that um, relationship-based um, teaching that we have in the classroom. And the collaboration, of course, we have Ho-Chunk Renaissance that collaborates. They come in and help teach some language and um, they'll teach language through games, through song, and just through modeling. Um, there's some artwork that we try to, we try to use things that are part of their culture. Um, they have feathers. We did a study on feathers last year. Uh, what part of the bird the feather comes from just by looking at it. And we did a lot of art projects that involved feathers. We had Ho-Chunk Renaissance come in and teach them their own music. And if anybody was at the Christmas program last year, you recognize those signs that they have in front of them. And basically our children are just taught as much as possible using Ho-Chunk language and culture. And this is a little slide that talks about, or that shows how we came up with that cultural curriculum. We put the huge post-its on, on the wall and identified each one by the month of the year in Ho-Chunk. And then we started listing all the things that happened during that month. And from there, we could um, develop lessons based on these, these topics. And we also assigned um, a one of the five core values to each one of the months. We come up with our own, our own worksheets and other classroom materials. Um, this was, we did studies about clans and we were able to um, take a study about a clan and create a science lesson based on that clan as well as social studies and art. So each clan we were able to um, teach that across the curriculum. Um, so like maybe one week we were studying about the Shungjongki Kikarach, the wolf clan. And so throughout the week during science, we might be studying different parts of um, a wolf Maybe the next day would be wolf habitats. And there's like so many different ways that you can use the wolf to incorporate science. And then you also social studies when we start talking about friendship clans and how wolf clan people serve the tribe and so sacred possessions. We were also able to share with the children and the families the clan colors because um, many, most of the clans have colors that they identify with. And once they learn their clan colors, that kind of dictates how their regalia is designed as well. And we also wanted to return to them their elders. Um, we wanted to bring, we have an elders chair in our classroom. And what we want to do is invite elders and we have brought in several elders. And this elder that's shown here is uh, Jack Lemaire my dad, who served in the Coast Guard during Vietnam. And he was telling stories about the different types of ships that he sailed in uh, during the war and during his service. He also did a 
talked a little bit about the lighthouses that he lived in. So he was able to um, share his life experiences but with the children, which also helps them to reinforce their image of elders and their Ho-Chunk heritage. Um, we want to return to the children, their language. Um, we have Avery LaPointe and Purnell Blackfish. In the classroom, they're known as Nijumani and Hosep, and that's how the children refer to them. Um, I've assigned the task of teaching direct language lessons to the children, um, to Avery and Hosep. And Avery, is there anything you want to talk about during this part? Um, I would just say that um, a big contribution to um, our success with the language is um, encouraging um, all the students like every day and um, trying to incorporate as much of the language as you possibly can and like the calendar. Um, we go over um, the how to um, what month is it, what season is it, what's the date, and all that stuff, and we go over all that in Ho-Chunk, and um, after that, we try to incorporate more vocabulary words, um, like with the emotions and stuff. We ask them, Johnny Skeshanank, or how are you doing today, and um, we give them an opportunity to pick an emotion from that list and then they uh, have practice using the language every day. And then um, after we go through the calendar stuff, then um, we go into like the more vocab stuff where um, we take the words from novice low and we put them up on the board like one at a time. And then they practice saying, saying each word, like I'll put a picture up of a dog and then they'll be able to say shunk like really fast and they'll be able to memorize it. And um, yeah, at one point we started going over like, um, it was like 200 slides in the morning and that's kind of carried away, but it worked. <laughs> but, yeah, the children pick it up very quickly, especially the, you know, as we use it in the classroom, we try to encourage them. Once you learn a whole chunk word, use the whole chunk word. Um, so right now they're speaking in full sentences um, when it comes to everyday phrases. They can ask you um, if they can go to the bathroom. They can ask that fully in whole chunk. Then they learned, um, we scaffolded on that. Now they can ask, can I go to the bathroom after so-and-so? So they've learned to expand their sentences as well. Um, we also um, give back to them their, their education and their tradition, their physical education and traditional games. And we try to do that through hikes, um, through games, traditional games that Ho-Chunks used to play. Um, right here, they're learning, you know, the odd dump and, um, this year we have we have gym time. Last year we weren't able to make it into the schedule. So we had to have our find our time wherever we could or find our space wherever we could, whether it was in a hallway in the atrium or on the track. Um, a lot of times we went across the road in that park or down downtown at the old ball field, but the children, you know, they had a lot, they had a good time. They didn't know that anything was missing. So they had uh, a lot of fun last year and even more fun this year now that they can play things like uh, lacrosse or chabana as it's known. The children learn to make their own snow snakes and shoot those. They, in the actual game of snow snake, there's like a little tunnel that these are uh, kind of like a tube that the snow snakes travel in. And that's why they call them snow snakes because as people throw them, the snakes will, you know, go back and forth inside that tube as they're going down the, the chute. And our kids didn't have that. We were in the atrium. Uh, some people may have seen that, but 
since we're in the atrium, the kids actually learned how to sh uh, shoot those snow snakes pretty straight without having the having to rely on that that tube. They also learned how to play the tree game. That was one that they really enjoyed. And we also kind of indigenized modern games. This is a rock, paper, scissors hopping game. And we call it, we call it the hopping game, but the words for rock, paper, scissors are ini, wagach, widuchkis. And here's a little example of the children playing that. Okay, so that's just a little example of um, one of the games that we've indigenized for the, the students using language um, or incorporating language in some of the games that they play. Oops. Um, so the family, uh, we when I talked about earlier about how the family structure was um, pretty much destroyed um, by the residential school system, that's kind of one of the things that we also wanted to strengthen through the education of um, these little relatives. And by that, we teach them family roles as well as um, child care practices. And this lesson, they're learning how uh, babies were carried around and how they were. Um, kept safe, and they were learning two different types of uh, baby cradles, and so they they were each able to design and um, create their own their own little baby baby cradles, and they had a lot of fun with this. They they really put in a lot of hard work to that, and we also wanted to return to them their science their own science and their own social studies because um, through indigenous education. Um, there was a lot of science. Uh, our, our people taught heavily in science because of everything that they had to know in order to survive. But in this particular lesson, they learned about the Dakota 38 plus two memorial ride. And uh, this incorporated uh, mostly social studies because of how the Dakota Wars affected the Ho-Chunk people. I mean, that's how we lost our land in Minnesota. Um, but we also incorporated some science in there by um, studying about horses and the uh, anatomy of horses, as well as um, how, how riders might prepare for winter travel. And then as far, far as art went, um, they were able to design their own horse after studying about horse markings and the meanings of horse markings. 
Um, that year also, I went to the, the end of the ride and got a lot of pictures and videos of the horses, the horse riders coming into Mankato. And this year we're hoping that we can get even more involved in the Dakota 38 plus two Memorial ride. And I'm hoping to um, maybe even meet the, the riders at some point to the north of us. Um, returning to them, their sense of indigenous identity. This is one project that we did where we used uh, the social emotional skills that we were encouraging, um, as well as um, art, using art in order to solidify some of that or reinforce some of that. They created their own self portraits. Um, the next art class, they um, created the feathers and the way we did that is the feathers were representative of their strengths. Okay. And Can you hear me, Susan? Yes. How are you doing? Good, good. No. Hey, sorry, I couldn't no. tell you. Uh, my phone crashed and I, have, I was having a really hard time getting your phone because it was not saved yet. And I was like, okay, I had to scramble. So I had to buy a new phone and stuff like that. So that's what happened. No. Yeah. You're on speaker. Yeah, and actually, the funniest thing is, um, uh, you know, I backed up. There we go. All right. So, um, when you ask children to list their their strengths, a lot of times it's just I don't know if they say anything at all. They might say one or two things, but if you ask their peers to list somebody's strengths, man, the list goes on and on and on and on. And the look on the child's face, like with um, like the first one, Mabel. The look on her face when all of her peers were listing all the things that they think she's good at. Um, you could see her, you know, she was bashful and beaming at the same time. And each one of the students reacted the same way. And it also gave them a, the opportunity to be encouraging towards each other and to look and be able to identify somebody else's strengths and have the, um, I guess, the courage to, to share that with them. So it was really a really good exercise. Um, so after we gave them a list of all the strengths that their peers um, came up with, they chose their five favorite ones and listed them on the feathers on the bottom. The circles, uh, we did a lot of studying about coping skills, uh, whether it was grounding, learning how to ground or talking to parents, talking to peers, talking to teachers, or whether it was, you know, we had them identify things that they do when they're having a really hard time. What do they do to calm down or to feel safe or um, to feel okay again? So they started coming up with things. I listen to music, I draw, I play with my dog or I play with my cat. So they came up with a, a lot of different ways um, that they use as coping skills. And that's what was written in the circles were their own uh, coping skills. And we talked about uh, the different um, struggles that children go through. And we didn't identify any specific struggles, um, but you know, they, they all know, you know the things that they see, the things that they face throughout their little lives. So that red hand um, is a symbol for like touching your enemy and so we talked about all the struggles that they've seen so far, the struggles they see and that they've, um, they've faced those things and they're still here. They've used their coping skills and have got, they've come through on the other side. And so we teach them that no matter how bad things get, they can be okay afterwards. And they use, they rely on those uh, coping skills that they've identified in order to get through the hard times and the struggles. And as representative of the hard times or the struggles they've already faced, they made the red hand symbol on their, their little shields. Um, also in the, in the left side of her shield, you see these little markings that look like plus signs. That's a symbol for stars. And a lot of uh, indigenous tribes believe the stars are where the ancestors go. And we did a study on Ho-Chunk, um, notable Ho-Chunks where the children learn about Ho-Chunk people 
that have accomplished uh, a lot historically, politically, um, scientifically, maybe through arts. And um, we study about all those, all those Ho-Chunk people and all their accomplishments and also about all their struggles. So those little symbols represent the ancestors that have come before them and that have paved the way so that they can um, either follow in their footsteps or accomplish things even beyond what they did. So that was that was an excellent study that we did. And it took several, several weeks in order for them to complete this, this project. And these students were uh, very proud of what they did. Um, community collaboration, we, this is a list of all the, the, the programs and organizations that we collaborate with. And they have provided our kids with so much in the way of lessons and experiences. Um, like the kids learned how to tap um, trees to make syrup. Um, they learned, you know, a lot about, of course, about at the tribal farm. Um, the Angel Decor Museum has provided them with so many lessons and um, we're very grateful for our collaboration with them. The kids are also learning about traditional practices and they're able to participate in a lot of them. And we did this again this year. Um, during this time, they also learning about how to use a whole plant. They, they learned how to save the corn silk and make corn silk tea and what that was used for. Um, again, we're talking about traditional clothing, returning back to um, we're normalizing traditional clothing. Um, and being creative, the, the little guy there on the right is showing off his shield and everything that all his coping skills and his strengths. And the little guy on the left is creating his own powwow stand. And he also identified like what he was gonna sell in his powwow stand. And they even set up a little arena on the floor after that. Uh, we try to use uh, issues, Native American issues, as well as traditional practices in order to create um, artistic opportunities. Um, also, traditional art like um, applique designs. Uh, we had the Angel Decor Museum come in and teach the art in nature. They do puppet shows. Um, this is a picture of, you know, some little relatives making their other friends laugh, and they really enjoy that. They're pretty creative. Um, also dance and music, again, like we were talking about before, we try to incorporate that as much as possible. And these kids are always ready to dance. Um, we also, I also have taken up dance again so that the children will see me out there. Um, in that way, they can make that connection between their cultural practices and school. You know, like uh, I remember what after one powwow, the kids came back and they were asking one kid that didn't show up. <laughs> he was like, where were you? The whole squad was out there. And they, they're kind of encouraging each other to get out and dance. Um, the, the guys at the drums are also encouraging the students as well by letting them hang out at the drum and learn to sing. We spend a lot of our time uh, on field trips and learning a lot of science and social studies through that. And the kids really enjoy their time outside. They even um, have taken it upon themselves to clean up litter while they're out there. So we have to designate a bag for trash. In spiritual practices, the children smudge every morning and they're taught the, some of the teachings surrounding that, that particular practice. Uh, they're also taught um, practices about how to, how to behave at a traditional gathering, um, how to dress, how not to dress. Um, standing up and speaking, they're getting more and more practice about standing up in front of other people and speaking. And we're also returning to them their medicine. Um, this is a, where the children are creating their own, their own medicines and their own dried foods. 
uh, they're making corn silk tea here where they make their own little, they, we, we dehydrated the corn silk and then they're making tea bags out of them. We also harvested some wild leeks and they're drying those. And our last one is um, teaching weaving. We teach weaving using cattails, using paper, um, yarn. But there's this weaving is just used in so many practices among the Ho Chunk people that we try to use, teach weaving in as many different ways as possible. Um, soon we're going to teach them how to make baskets. So that's that's coming up soon. And um, Wagi Goose Nijumani, um, Avery, had gone to a class in Wisconsin in order to learn the practices. And she's going to take the lead on teaching that class. And that's all we got. So if there are any questions. Hi, mine's more, um, this is Nephthys Husto. I have more of a comment. I just want to tell you that you, um, from what you've shown, you guys are doing amazing. It's like the exact thing that we would love to see in all of our schools is that kind of a program where we're able to bring more of the culture and language in. Oh, and the another place that we receive a lot of collaboration is from UNL. Uh, we did a lot of, we got a lot of help from Trisha Gray and Kara Vieska, as well as Nancy Engen Wadeen. Um, they've helped us tremendously. Um, the Roots program provided most of the books, the indigenous books that we have in our classroom. We have a lot of them now. And um, Kara Vieska provided a lot of the research in dual language classrooms um, around the globe that we were able to read about and figure out how to design our classroom. A lot of positive comments in the chat, Michelle. Amazing work. Um, Michelle, oh. can you hear me? This is yeah. Here. Oh, Sherry. Hi. Uh, I saw that uh, in the affirmations that that several of the students uh, were praised at being good at math. And you know, I have to ask about math. I, I was wondering uh, where math fits into your program and what you might be doing in, I'm sure it's in, you know, I imagine that it's uh, combined in these other studies, but just um, how do you touch upon math in, in your program? Um, there were two subjects that were required to follow the public schools curriculum, and one of them is in reading, and the other one is in math, but we are able to squeeze in language in there as well. So, um, and kind of as I will teach what's in the book, um, what's scripted there, and then we'll reinforce it with language and maybe some hands-on activities. And um, a lot of the activities that I have, as well as my uh, my backpack full of goodies, those come in handy. And the kids, I think, really enjoy the hands-on stuff. So anything that we can incorporate into a game or into a hands-on activity, we'll do that. And that's, I think, how they they have become so strong in math because that's pretty much their best subject right now is math. I'm glad to hear that. And I, I, you'll recall that we talked about squeezing in good math, even if the math program that's set up for you is not so great. So I'm so happy to hear that. I knew it would be true. You know, you were such an excellent student in the math classes that we shared together. And I'm so glad to hear that. So you made my day. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So impressed. Oh, thanks, Sherry.
Any other questions? This is Trish Gray. Can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Michelle. It's so good to see Hi, you. Hi, Trish. Yes, yeah, good to see you again. This is so fantastic. I'm just sitting here in awe. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, Diana talked about the, um, the the struggle that a lot of teachers have with administration and support for for the work that they're doing. And I'm just wondering what kind of, in what ways does your administration support you? And in what ways have you been kind of bringing them along and teaching them as you go? Um, the, the higher administration has been incredibly supportive, um, particularly with Dan Farringer, the superintendent. He and Lewis were the ones who came up with the, the whole plan and the, the idea of creating this classroom. And they're the ones that called me in and proposed the idea to me. So they have been providing a lot of, a lot of support, especially um, financially. The, if the school can't cover something, the tribe will cover it. So we do have um, sources on both, both sides of the coin that um, we can depend on. Uh, like in our classroom, um, it seems like half of what we have was provided by the tribe and half of what we have is provided by the school. So we, ha we do have a lot of support from the, the administration, the higher up administration. And I think uh, maybe if there was more education for the uh, rest of the staff, I think there, there would be even a smoother transition into the development of this classroom. Um, I don't know if people just didn't know what it was we were doing or if there was some type of um, uh, assumptions made without you know finding out, but um, I think a lot of that is smoothing out now. And I think as long as people learn what it is that we're doing, um, I don't think there's that much of a problem with it anymore. But I think yeah, that if I was to recommend this to any other school, I would say educate your staff about what this classroom is about, the goals of the classroom, how those goals might be different from the rest of the classrooms and just kind of nip any problems in the bud before they even have a chance to get off the ground. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So again, there's many uh, positive comments in the chat, but there is one question and it says, how did you get established with UNL? Oh, that's where I went to school. So I had um, a lot of the people that helped us were former instructors, um, but you, it's also um, a collaboration between UNL and Ho-Chunk Renaissance that um, we're able to kind of um, get in some of the activities that they're doing. And um, so like Trish, Trisha was a former um, instructor of mine and Kara, I think, was a student teacher. I can't remember, or uh, assistant professor. And um, but through some of the the courses that I took at UNL, I was able to make the the connections with those people, and they were um, invaluable in providing a lot of the research and information. And whenever I needed something researched, um, oh, wait, Kara was right on it, and she was able to provide me with more reading than I could get done. Anything else before we move on to Weetha? Uh, Michelle, you might wanna take some time and just read the comments. There's a lot of positive comments in the chat. Okay. And um, just wanna say thank you, this has been Wonderful. Um, I know about your classroom. Don't, you know, so going in depth of what you guys are doing, it's amazing. And um, Pina Gigi to you, all the staff, the program um, for this uh, and presenting today too for the summit. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Yep. Um, 
we'll, we'll move on to um, our next speaker and she is, um, she'll tell you her name. Yeah, uh, Weetha Aldrich. <laughs> um, she's uh, from the Winnebago Ho-Chunk and say it for me, Weetha. Connie. And uh, Mohawk Reservation in Northern New York. Okay. And she's a nani to her amazing son, Mata J. Uh, I grew up in Winnebago, Nebraska, graduated from the University of Nebraska Lincoln with the Bachelors of English Arts. She briefly worked for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Human Resources and then worked at uh, SUNY Postum in the Office of Native American Affairs in the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and was enrolled in an MPA program at Beaning, Beaning, Beaning Hampton University with the focus on genocide and mass atrocity prevention. And she currently while well, previously was serving as the curriculum development specialist for the Winnebago tribe in our department and moved to the Renaissance just in these last couple of weeks. But um, her, what she was working on um, a few years ago, we started uh, developing a curriculum around the Ho-Chunk um, culture and language uh, for kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, we had a committee that uh, worked on some lesson lessons um, to teach and got about nine weeks done for each grade level and uh, when that grant ended and we were fortunate enough to um, have a good partnership with our public school that helped fund um, her position for uh, two years, so this would be going on the second year, and, um, you know, having Weetha's knowledge and um, to add on to what was there um, was really, uh, we were really blessed with that, and uh, many thanks to you, Weetha, and, um, you know, looking forward to what you do up at the language program, uh, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Weetha. Okay. Um. Yep, thank you for the, the introduction. Um, good morning, my name is Dawanda Huita Aldridge. Um, I grew up here in the Winnebago Indian Reservation and like mentioned in my intro there, um, I attended UNL and did a couple things after, um, after school. So when uh, approaching this cultural curriculum initiative, um, there was a number of different experiences that I've got gotten to um, um, bring um, bring into the the curriculum here. Um, looking at a social studies uh, curriculum, um, and when we first when we were first working on it, there was there was a lot of the the fundamentals that were there um, that were that was already included in into the the work that have been has been done which was like the definition of communities um treaties um and those kind and those kinds of things um but the one of the challenges with the curriculum is is how do we how do we break down um what it what a treaty what a treaty is because what was there was um basically um, entire visual of the treaty and all of the basically all of, all of the language but how do you how do you break that down to a second grader so that was kind of one of the um, one of the challenges there and of course with developing a curriculum especially with a social studies curriculum is identifying that scope um, in that sequence so eventually what I've what I gotten to um, get to was dividing each grade into four units and each unit asks a, a question. So for example, for second grade, um, unit one is how did we get here? Unit two is who were important people to our community? And unit three is what are important places in our community? And unit four would be the idea of like exploring the idea of narrative. So what is consent? Where can we find stories? And what is what is a knowledge keeper? And also kind of looking at cultural appropriation. 
um, again, these are kind of like, these are broader terms, but um, the challenge for me was how do we break that down to um, a second grader? Um, one other layer in, in working with this curriculum is when we're researching and finding um, accurate indigenous history and putting them into spaces where um, newly introducing them into spaces where indigenous, accurate indigenous history isn't typically um, taught or just, just due to the fact that it's new is that's decolonial, um, that's decolonial work. Um, so with the decolonial work, there is like a level of fatigue that comes behind it, especially if you've been doing that for um, for so long. So that was that was one of the challenges um, working on the curriculum is doing um, researching and uh, creating systems and creating presentations and lessons and those kinds of things um, around um, around de decolonizing spaces and turning our um, learning spaces into transformative place spaces for indigenous students. So there's a bit of fatigue that comes along with decolonial work that, you know, maybe some educators and um, different people can uh, relate to. Um, so um, one of the things that um, Michelle mentioned was the importance of boarding school. And I was wondering, do I have the ability to share on here, on the uh, share my screen on here? Chris, can you make Wita the presenter? Yeah, yeah, she should be able to share her screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, application. That's not what I was trying to do. There we go. Okay, so whenever um, included in the social studies standards for Nebraska, there's a there's a brief moment where it talks about um, indigenous boarding schools and. And um, while we're researching um, researching those those things, we found here um, a list from the Genoa Indian Genoa Indian Industrial School, and what this represents is really kind of like the beginning of where Indian education is for our community. Um, we're at the beginning of. What am I trying to say here? But if you look at the screen here, oops, I gotta look. If you look at the screen here, um, these are all all our relatives, and this is a snapshot of one summer, um, a list of students that went on vacation. So, if you look at it, this is just a snapshot of one point in given time. It's not the entire attendance. It's not a list of um, the entirety of the Genoa Indian Industrial School, how long it's been on. This was just one snapshot and it has it has a lot of our last names um, here. These, so we have Armel, um, Decora, Pear, Rave, and, and those kinds of things. So I just wanted to share that list there because that's the, that's the, the foundation of where our um, where our education is started um, for our community and and um, and our and our relatives and why it's important that um, we kind of dive into teaching accurate indigenous um, history. Um,
And the next thing I can share is what one of the units um, looks like. So this is second grade. Um, and the idea of second grade is to apply their emerging understandings of civics, economics, geography, and history to their communities around the world. Um, what's designed here in this lesson is building resiliency. Um, what is the definition of community? What is a treaty? Why is a treaty important to want a bagel? And we have a whole trunk removal activity and um, checking in. Um, um, we start here with um, little priests, so be strong, educate my children. So um, one of the lessons here is, is we ask the students if, the fam if they're familiar with this quote, with this quote, um, why this quote was important uh, before he passed away. And we're gonna break this quote down with the students. So talk about what does education mean to them? What is their favorite subject and why? And then after you've discussed education, focus on the first part of um, be strong and ask the students, what does strength mean to them? And these questions and their responses can, it basically will build a discussion about um, resilience. Um, but the idea here though, because there's so many layers in building a curriculum for indigenous students is to also be mindful of, of being um, trauma informed. So like with indigenous communities are very, um, I wouldn't say post, post genocide communities, but because there's ongoing forms of genocide, but um, this here, it gives a, it gives a space to, to address their their strengths. So, what are um, what are the things that have gotten us through uh, our difficult periods in history? And there's a lesson here where we um, where we build a resilient uh, resiliency toolbox. So, um, one of Bagel history is full of interesting events, but does not include um, uh, but does not exclude sad and tragic events over time. Due to these sad and tra tragic events, our people have have had to build resiliency. As we go through the lessons, remember that it's okay to feel sad or uncomfortable feelings, but to always remember that we have built um, an amazing resiliency over time and things we do every day that we can use. We can call it our resiliency um, toolbox. And the instructions the instructions, instructions here indicate that, you know, you can be creative as you want with the, the toolbox. So the class together would um, put together a cardboard box and they can design it and those kinds of things. Um, but they gather in a discussion and discuss um, some of the things that they do together that get them through difficult times. Um, and so it's really, it's like a collaborative experience with the, the student and the teachers because the teachers are getting to know the, the students and they're having a real discussion about, well, you know, what are some things that you can turn to um, that get you through difficult times? And the hope here with this lesson is, you know, maybe some students will say, well, I like to listen to music or I, or I do like to sing or I like to smudge or those kinds of things. And um, the teacher would take inventory on some of these practices and try to incorporate it into the classrooms um, because within teaching um, history, especially with the uh, Nebraska and teaching about land land allotment and treaties and those kinds of things and those difficult lessons. It's important to um, check in with the the students at the beginning of the lesson and also to um, check in with them at the end of the lesson while you're opening up a difficult uh, difficult conver difficult conversation. Um, so there's. Um, one of the things that I did with a uh, treaty is we made a treaty, um, a treaty uh, agreement worksheet and the definition of a treaty is just the legal agreement between two nations 
and what one worksheet would look like is um, so call on a student to discuss who was a part of their agreement. So was mom or dad or kaka or grandson or was it between the mom and the son? And one example is an agreement between a mother and, and a son. So saying like, if you do your chores, you're allowed to play your video game um, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And uh, the treaty agreement worksheet, it's broken down into here's the party. And then in the party bubble, you would write mom. And then um, in the other party bubble, you would write son. And then what, what each of the conditions that they're providing. So the son would write, I would have to do my chores. And then the mother would write their end of the agreement. And then in the middle, there's the final agreement, which is what the trade-off was. Um, just so they can kind of get the basic concept of treaties and um, get to exercise their own decision making, which like historically um, making consensual agreements with the US government, um, a lot of the a lot of things that took place in the past were not consensual. And this um, this lesson here provides a space where um, the students um, get to practice uh, make an agreement that is a consensual agreement and then also build their idea of what what a treaty um, what a treaty is. So that was um, kind of a breakdown of a treaty there. Um, so that's that's one lesson and a part of um, part of introducing a curriculum into, a new space, um, there has to be professional development. Um, and a lot of the professional development we discussed, um, I'll put over here. with professional development, we discussed different things such as um, bias, the, important, the importance of bias and how, how, it function in, how it functions in our community and our rural communities and um, those kinds of things. So let's go over here. Um, part of the training included the objective, the objective of the training was to create and encourage transformative and inclusive learning spaces for our students here in the Winnebago community. And again, looking at um, providing accurate indigenous history, we're addressing colonialism and um, the inter uh, intersectionalities with racism, bias, privilege, and historical trauma. We try to be mindful of all these, try to be mindful of bringing these layers into the curriculum, but also teaching lesson plans that are like appropriate for um, second, third, and fourth graders. Um, Let's see where one of these pictures are relevant here. Um, right, so I try to utilize these uh, these models to as a foundation for some of the, the curriculum. So with having a curriculum that's that's accurate and we're exploring different areas of whole trunk life and historical facts about New York State, or not New York State, um, Nebraska and its relationship with um, indigenous people. Um, we're breaking down these ideas of, of bias. Um, and like Michelle mentioned earlier, this cultural genocide that has taken place in um, these boarding schools and things like that, um, it's very intentional. And that's one of the things that goes along with genocide studies is it's a it's a coordinated um, activity. So that's one of the things that we try. What one thing a curriculum can achieve is by having that that accuracy, you can break down this um, this strong foundation here of of bias. So these other things kind of don't have the ability to occur. Um, Yeah, so I mean, 
thankful for being uh, patient with me. Um, I am position uh, transitioning from one program to another, so I just appreciate your um, y'all's patience while I presented there. Do we open it up for questions or? Yep. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions for Witha around? I have a question. Witha, is there, uh, do you have like a plan of how you're going to continue the work you have been doing with, um, under the umbrella of Ho-Chunk Renaissance? Um, mainly right now there's um, not much that I can do at this point, except I have a lot of the found foundational work, like the writing um, that's left there um but that's about that's about it um but i do believe that there's a space for professional uh development for for educators that like the community can take on because it looks like there's a need in in our community that we're always looking um, at that professional development um so i think that's one way that it can 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 um continue Yeah, oh, so yes. curriculum, sorry, um, that you have created, is this then like, would be a standalone, or it's in addition to like the required state standard um, curriculum that students have, where you're building onto that? Oh, yeah, so it's, it's not a standalone, it's, um, it follows this, the state standards. So it's just lesson plans that are being provided. Um, because the school funds the tribe for it to develop these lesson plans. And that's the, um, that's one of the things that that has to be taken, taken place is um, introducing this to the, to the educators. So it's not standalone, I would say it's more collaborative. We thought, thank yeah. you so much for uh, your presentation. And I, I really liked the fact that you included uh, professional development. I think that's something that's needed just across the board. My question is, um, do you ever collaborate or or meet with um, the Winnebago in Wisconsin? Or um, I, I just wondered if there was ever any interaction between the two, two tribes. So, um, at most, I've gotten material from Marion um, Holstein, and that's different educational resources that Wisconsin uses. So, um, with some of the treaty exercises um, and worksheets that are going to be provided, those comes from the Wisconsin land use textbooks and those kinds of things. Um, other than that, I think that's kind of like one of the big questions for our community is like, how do we how do we engage with our Wisconsin relatives? Yeah, I think they, you know, they've lost a lot because they were removed uh, from their homelands. And uh, while everybody got moved around, um, I think they were they were somehow more isolated out there without familiar surroundings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Again, we feel there's comments in, okay. um, in the chat. Uh, and the lessons are in Google Classroom, right? The, the school's Google Classroom, so they're accessible. Um, is there any other questions for Weetha? Is that Google Classroom um, 
the link to it available? Uh, I think it's specific to the Winnebago Public School, right, Lika? Yeah. This time, we hope to um, get it out, get it out down the road, but uh, the original nine week lessons were put in Google Classroom. And so we could just continued that, but um, hoping, you know, we can get it out somehow uh, down the road. We are advertising that position um, hoping to get somebody as awesome as Weepa to come in and fill that role. Um, but yeah, just, uh, I'm sure, you know, we'll still work with, uh, Weepa in some capacity to keep building on this. Um, is there anything else? Um, we could probably take a short, you know, maybe a 10 minute break. Uh, we have uh, Dalberta and Brenda up next, um, just a few minutes early, but we're kind of getting back on track. So um, right now it is 1036, um, how about we come back at 1050? Um, and uh, we'll have Dalberta and Brenda present on their outdoor classroom. Thank you. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Dalberta and Brenda um, from the Omaha Public Schools. Um, I'll read Dalberta's bio. My name is Dalberta Frazier and I teach at the Omaha Nation Public School in Macy, Nebraska in the newly developed outdoor classroom. I come from the Santee, Yankton, and Cheyenne River Sioux people. My Indian name is Hoputowi, which means blue wing woman. I am a proud mother and grandmother. I've told 12 children, eight sons, four daughters, and 15 grandchildren. I lived most of my life on the Omaha reservation where I've raised my family. I attended Nebraska Indian Community College and received, received my associate's degree in liberal arts in 1991 and attended one year of nursing school at Presentation College in Eagle Butte, South Dakota. I graduated from the University of Nebraska Lincoln in 2001 with a Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education through the Indigenous Roots Teacher Ed Program. I'm currently working towards a master's degree in science education. Welcome to Alberta, and I will read Brenda. Brenda Murphy has taught in schools and educational settings in Walt Hill, Winnebago, and Macy, Nebraska. In her work, Brenda has served all age groups from Head Start to College, which includes working in a tribal language program. For the past seven years, Brenda has undertaken leadership positions in the field of outdoor education. In our position at the Omaha Nation School, she served as program developer teacher for the, I can't say that word. Um, outdoor, okay. Outdoor classroom program as fourth and fifth grade science teacher and as a second grade teacher. During the 21 years Brenda has taught in Nebraska, she has developed an extensive teaching skill set that has led to creating a separate culturally relevant outdoor classroom as an adjunct to the school curriculum. Brenda is both a first generation high school graduate and a first generation college graduate. She received a BA and MA in education at UNL and is currently enrolled in the EdD program specializing in teaching curriculum and learning. Her personal statement, nature-based education has always been a part of my life. It's how I think and is my teaching comfort zone. So welcome Brenda in Dalberta, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everybody, I'm here in my classroom and we are, we are co, we co-teach. So one starts a sentence as one finishes it. <laughs> Brenda, um, um, do you want to introduce yourself and then we'll then I'll start. 
unmute yourself, Brenda. Okay, so every day before we start our 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 day with the kids, um, when we first started working together uh, a few years back, I was teaching a house class, and it was a middle school class, and they were just out of control. Nobody was listening. They were all monkeying around, and and I kept thinking, you know, I, I need to manage this class. How, what are my skills? What are my skills? And everything we were trying was just kind of just getting sold back in our case and something a soft voice said, you know what, you need to sing to them. One of my, uh, so I uh, started singing a spirit calling song and culturally before uh, we started anything, we always offered prayer in the song. So before we start, um, Brenda asked if I would share the song with you that um, I sing to our students before we start every day. And I give them a little tiny piece of sage and they, I, they take that sage and then they rub it into a little tiny ball. Give it a smell. When I tell them we sit quietly when you hold the sage, because uh, the great spirit, the great mystery, has give, blessed it with the power to heal people. And when you're holding so much power in your hand that you sit quietly and respectfully and let it be, let it do its job. <clears throat> so if you'll just uh, bear with me a moment, I'm going to share this song with you. It's a culture prayer song, and they use uh, this song when they go out and seek a vision, when they're um, crying out to the Creator for help. And that's what we do every day to um, ask for guidance and peace and, and calmness in our hearts. Oh, Thank you, Delverta. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, right down the bottom of the okay. screen there, you should be able to do that. Um, I don't see on here what I'm looking for. It's a green, green icon. I don't see it down, down there, it's green, it says share screen. Just take your cursor down to the bottom. There you go. Okay. This isn't the one I wanted to share, but hold on. Okay. All right. Um, and this one is called On Bee's Wings, Coming Home to Teaching in the Natural World. Um, as many of us older teachers um, have experienced when we started out in life, we were kids. And most of us didn't have stuff. We had outdoors. And that's where we went and we spent most of our time. Um, when we started teaching and taking our students outside, they had this little bubble around them. And that's as far as they saw. And it was about as far away as a cell phone would be or, or an electronic device. And they wouldn't see the migrations of birds and they wouldn't see squirrels and they wouldn't see you know, other things going on, notice the bees or anything like that. But over time that changed, the more we took them out, the more they began to see. Um, in Donkason, in fall, we talk about 
harvest and migration and change. And when we take the kids out, um, that's what our focus is. Um, har harvest time, setting seeds, we take seeds to save them for spring. Um, hibernation, where do all, everything in the fall makes a decision, whether it's a plant, an animal, an insect, it makes a decision of what am I going to do when it gets too cold and when there's not enough daylight. Some of them migrate, some of them die, lay their eggs and die, and some of them hibernate. And some of them do the in-between where they just go someplace that's warm and come out during the day and, and do what they do. So we look for signs of that, signs of those changes going on. And it's also the time for us to put our garden to bed. Um, Magashude. And if I mess that up, Delbert, I apologize. How do you say it? Yeah. <laughs> it's winter. It's dormancy, introspection, survival. That decision that those animals and, and insects and everything, even humans make that decision. Um, where do we go? And we learn to dress for the weather. Um, we'll take them out. 40 degree wind chill. We'll take them out. We have coats in our room that have been donated so that kids have a warm winter coat. We have hats, we have mittens, gloves, and we take them out. We only take them out for about five minutes at the most. And if somebody says I'm too cold, then we come in. What does too cold mean? It means you're not comfortable. We talk about frostbite um, and all those kind of things so that the kids understand when they're out playing, yes, their hands will hurt if they get it. They get too cold, but then they'll stop hurting, and that's when the damage happens. So I want them to know those kind of things. We both do. Um, we talk about identifying tracks in the snow or the mud. Um, it's also a time for stories and a time for planning gardens and time to put food out for those. Like last winter, um, we had a really really late summer and it continued and it was dry and a lot of the animals that would have left and the birds that would have left were eating up all the seeds that would normally be winter food for the other birds and so we started putting out some food to help augment what they wouldn't have so it's caring for others um made pahanga in the spring mother earth awakens the land turns green first thunder wakes the snakes, um, return of migratory birds, we start planting outdoors the hardy crops, search for sign of spring, first flowers, and of course it's mushroom hunting time. This is a big time for the kids. Um, and in moss day, in summer, um, days are longer, it's a growing time, um, our shadows get shorter, Vegetable growing, foraging, um, identifying some medicinal plants as they grow, um, knowing what to avoid the poisonous plants. Um, severe weather, identifying severe weather. I'm a weather nerd, so I take the kids out in all kinds of weather. Um, bugs, bugs, and more bugs, and kids are all full of stories about hitting the powwow trail. So those are, those are things um, on, on bees' wings. Um, the, the big idea is the takeaway from this is um, children no longer spend a significant amount of time outside. And when they do go outside, you know that big buzzword, mindfulness. Well, it's not all about yoga. It's really about just being present wherever you are. And when they're present, when they're outside, it's very calming for them. We want to make connections. Um, because a cultural presence when you're teaching in a Native community, that culture should always be in what you're teaching. And so um, that's a really important aspect. Probably one of the most important is moments of awe and wonder. And if you can think for a minute of a time when you were young that you saw something absolutely amazing in nature, those stay with you. They, they make them um, 
more willing to protect the things that we love, the things that we've seen. And so um, creating those relationships by going out and, and seeing sun dogs in the morning. And Delberta, can you think of any that were significant for us? Oh, yeah, the sun dogs, the animals, are the clouds, the, um, the, the different clouds that we saw. Um, oh, let's see what else. Always the bugs. We now are um, the doing where they can start looking more closely at the bugs. Yeah, and they're not even scared of them. Tell them about the girl in the garden with the grasshopper. <laughs> so, um, and um, we were down to the big garden picking uh, green beans, and the little girl is scared to death of the grasshopper is hopping around in there. And then, you know, we tell her, you know, this is their home. Don't smash them. This is their home. You're coming here. You're a visitor. And then she, one landed on her. Instead of seeing it away, she started looking at it. And then she, it was like the, the bug, the grasshopper with his ability pulled her into his world. And she started looking very closely at the bug and she started talking with it. And then pretty soon I just heard her out of the corner of, uh, I heard her out of, cause I wasn't looking directly at her. She was by Brenda. She said, oh my gosh, I'm talking with the grasshopper. <laughs> and it's like the stories, those cultural stories that we hear of the relationship of when animals can speak and they're teaching us lessons, valuable lessons of life. And this little, bir little girl overcame her fear of, of these grasshoppers. And she realized that it was a living being and she gently, she wanted to take it with her. And then we're like, you know, uh, Brenda explained to her, you know, that just like us, it has a family somewhere and, you know, they're going to wonder where it's at and we're, we have to leave it here. And so it was a, a moment where that little, that little girl's heart was ignited with the fire of, of the natural world that it was just, you could just see that about her. So in it, 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 it was reaffirming of the power of nature and how it can teach us new lessons. We also spend, Delbert and I, a lot of time talking about environmental issues and how that impacts. And we want our middle school kids to become change makers, to become ones that are gonna be advocates for a better environment. Um, do you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, if we go on to our next slides, then we can talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So we're, we're going to transition to um, the next slide presentation. Um, you want to start with the first one, Brenda? Oh, sorry. So with, with what um, Mugonze was talking about, and Mugonze, that means teacher in Umaha. And I always call Brenda that because she's my teacher. <laughs> she teaches me so much. Um, so about, uh, uh, it's been four or five years now that um, by the Stabler, the Omaha Language and Culture Director, I was working with, um, working with her in the language program. And she said, Alberta, she said, um, the school approved for an outdoor classroom. And um, the, uh, the teacher, Brenda Murphy, is asking for a co-teacher and ask for recommendations. And I, Delbert, I want you to meet this lady. She said, I think you guys would do a wonderful job um, in developing this, she said, because it's including taking the kids outside. So um, right off the bat, Brenda and I, we, we um, we're, like she said, you know, we grew up outside um, those times in our lives. Um, back then, in those days, um, uh, we didn't have all of these electronics and going outside wasn't a risk. You know, uh, we could play outside from sun up to sundown and we'd rather be outside. And if you had to stay inside, it means you was going to be cleaning or doing some kind of work. <laughs> um, the, the Omaha uh, Language and Culture Program gave us this name 
I should tell day by day and means that go out and buy. And uh, one of our uh, co-teachers that worked with us for uh, a year, his name was Mike Wolf. And he said, you know, I remember that word. My grandma would always be yelling at us, Ashita, Ashita. And he said, now he said, I remember that means go outside. <laughs> it was like, you know, command. He was commanding you go outside. But this um, this first slide is um, is what Brenda was talking about. The four the four seasons. Uh, Ashita Dewa Day is a K through 12 nature based education program, and we developed a vision. And the vision is to create a journey of discovering and reclaiming Indigenous wisdom which promotes food sovereignty, sustainability, and being caretakers of our land. And this design right here that you're seeing um, was developed um, by Vida Stabler's um, daughter. Uh, I can't remember her name, Brenda. Um, Mihusa Stabler. Mihusa. She, uh, she designed this. And then I, um, uh, Mike Wolf helped me put the, um, uh, the, he, he, we put the words in there. Uh, he helped me de uh, develop the Tate Diva lessons. But so each quarter, like our first quarter, first nine weeks is um, don't go song. It's fall time, and we have lessons that go in there. And then the next nine weeks of class of of school is um it goes to the winter winter, um uh, and that towards the cold usmi ata diso. And then we come into the next nine weeks, and that's after January when we come back from uh, our Christmas break, is Mipa uh, Honga, and that's towards the sunrise. And then the last one is Mose Ata Duson, the south, towards the warmth. Mose is summer. And so in each quarter there, we have lessons uh, that we look at and that we. Uh, Culturally, you know, we're still working on that. And I just wanted to um, express my um, appreciation and thankfulness to the last presenters, all the ladies that spoke before us. Developing curriculum is a full-time job. Um, they give us a, a few hours every day in the morning. So it's like when, as soon as we get here, Brandon and I are having conversations because our day doesn't our days aren't like set in a scripted curriculum. Our days go by if it's nice, what the weather is outside, what we're going to be doing, um, the time of the season. So, um, uh, Wagonze has helped me to learn how to improvise and have these these lessons um, ready to go. You want to go to the anything you want to add, Brenda, before we go to the next slide? No, you did a great job. Thank you. You want, to, you want to talk about this one, Brenda? Um, the Ashita Dewa Day provides a K through 12 culturally relevant experience of learning, exploring, and understanding nature through traditional science. Um, and I heard someone once say that um, science, Western science has knowledge but cultural ways have the wisdom. And we want the children to, they have, they're supposed to in school experience the Western science, but they also need the traditional approach as well. The UNPS Ashta Dewa Day is an innovative nature-based education program which takes place in an outdoor setting. The curriculum has been developed to infuse all academic areas and indigenous wisdom into the lessons. Multiple sites have been developed for students to have a culturally relevant hands-on experience. The cultural foundation of the curriculum is based in part on the Omaha tribe's Tate Duba, Four Winds, Four Seasons. And there's a picture of the kids getting their picture taken. And that tree now um, has basically fallen apart after that really strong ice storm we had a year or so ago. And you want to talk to them about that picture down there with the kids? But that's our arts integration of um, talking about food sovereignty. Um, the 
our um, one of our um, elders who worked with us for a year, Mike Wolf, he developed helped develop this for us. He made the horns, and the kids um, learned about buffalo, how they were relevant to us culturally. And then, if you look in the background, because of the um, and I heard uh, the the social studies presentation, the genocide that took place in this in this land, the um, the taking of our language and our culture, all of these dances that the the buffalo was very significant. We both we built our culture around the buffalo. We were called the buffalo people in the Great Plains region, but all of that has been taken from us. So I didn't have any. Um, uh, examples of buffalo dances or uh, pictures, but I came across this. Uh, I think this is the Pueblo people back here that still do their buffalo dance, and I play that for the kids that um they're they're doing their seasonal dance back there, and the kids automatically became buffalo. <laughs> they started dancing and they and they just enjoyed that. But making 300 buffalo hats with the kids is not because we do this lesson. So we, we have three classes a day, and some days we see anywhere between 60 to 100 kids. And we want all of them to have that experience. And I'm really thankful to Mr. Mike Wolf that he was here for a year and he helped develop a lot of these cultural, cultural um, uh, lessons for us. And then, um, yeah, like she said, that picture right there, uh, that tree it came apart. It became a teaching tool for us because now we're teaching them how these things break back down. There's mushrooms there, and there's different things that are helping break this tree down. So um, everything that's outside has become a teaching tool for us. And the, oh, also before we go on, Brent. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go to the next slide. No, go ahead. Oh, no, no. How do I back it up? Okay, I'm not sure. You're going to have to um, get out of that. You went past it. You can hit the backspace key. Hit the backspace key. Okay. okay. And then I'll just go back up here and start it again. Yeah. Um, oh, no, it's yeah. doing something else. Click on that. Click on that okay, slide. I don't want to start a new meeting. No. Slideshow. This is what I need to do. Okay. Yep. All right. There you are. Go ahead. Uh, go, uh, go to the next slide again. So the administration um, helped uh, we receive funding for all of these. We um, created these um, outdoor classroom areas for learning. The students experience nature-based education through hands-on activities, food sovereignty and sustainability concepts are implemented through gardening projects. Um, the greenhouse was built uh, through, um, I can't remember the foundation, what's it called? The Julian Grace Foundation? Mm -hmm. um, we, built, we have a greenhouse and we have a little house of learning that used to be a Baha'i church there. If any of you from um, Macy or remember back in the days, the Baha'i church had a little place there. And then down in the other part is the medicine garden um, that's developed in a, uh, in a uh, morning star symbol. And then we have the seven acres um, planting life. You want to go on to the next one, Brenda? Yep. And that teaching the Wagonza will also have a puppet theater attached to the outside of it. And we also have a gathering circle there. Yeah, the gathering and, circle. And behind the greenhouse are two um, layers of vegetable garden. And at the very top will be a prairie barrier to keep the dust off the street from coming in. Go ahead. So in the greenhouse, um, the first year that we got the greenhouse going, there was abundance of vegetables and fruits and, um, that the students planted in there. 
Um, the first year, um, we used it without heat or ventilation. Um, they grew lots of greens, radishes uh, for the school salad bar and the wide variety of other plants. So um, yeah, it's called a pit greenhouse and it, it um, built under the, the ground. So we walked down into it so that when the frost comes, uh, it's below the frost line. I see one of the students there planting some, uh, I think she planted carrots, yeah. Let me go to the next one, I guess. Um, and then there's the, the kids, you could see it growing. Now the, the stuff that she was planting, the things are growing in there. And then we have posts on because now it's getting towards the winter time. And they grew cabbage, lettuce, radishes, tomatoes, carrots, onions, and a variety of flowers in there. And um, so these two pictures in the center here, and I'm this is my this is my word, but I don't say them. These are my two naughty boys. <laughs> um, you have those students that when they're in a classroom, they just struggle. But when we take them outside, they they're so helpful and they receive they start having a calming and a and a peaceful feeling, you know, and a connection to these living plants because every time they go out there, they see them grow a little more and a little more. And we teach about the life cycle of that. Um, there's one of our sixth graders. Um, they grew, that was the very first green bean that came in. She was so proud of it. She said, take a picture of my green bean. <laughs> um, they also grew some herbs um, such as lemon balm, parsley, cilantro, and dill. And these are through the, the um, winter months. We can go to the next one. So this is the harvest of the greenhouse. So everything that came in, we weighed and we measured. So that's what we're using our science. So I kind of always have the kids predict before we harvest. Let's predict on how much this is going to weigh. Well, how many are we going to get out of there? What's it going to weigh? So they, they all give a guess and then we always, um, uh, this is uh, one parsley and one dill. And we have a, a scale there. And then we, uh, after we picked it off there, we dried it, we have a food dehydrator. And then they um, dried it in the classroom or we put it in the food dehydrator. You wanna go to the next one, Linda? This is us harvesting in the in uh, February, and then in the winter time. This was it. Take, this was a few winters ago when we got some snow. Because last winter we didn't get any snow. Um, we would to play and to incorporate um, um, work with play. I always create games. So one of the ones that you see all the buckets of snow there. First, we would build snow forts. We would, I showed them how to do that because they didn't have any idea of what building a snow fort was. And so I had them pack that in there and then we just, you know, brick by block by block, we built snow forts. And then I said, okay, it's almost time to go in. So we have to, we take the snow inside and we let it melt and that's how we water our plants in the wintertime. And if you look back there, that's radishes and cabbage and stuff growing uh, through the winter months. And these are the girls, uh, picking their carrots that you've seen them planting earlier on in the season. And even though it's cold outside, the kids just love being outside. Even we make sure they're bundled up nice and warm. And this was when the pandemic first started, so that's why the kids all have their masks on. It's not only good for preventing COVID, but it's not good for keeping your face warm. <laughs> And so the spring of 2021, we put in our, our strawberry patch. You can see their little tiny um, uh, um, plants there. They all took turns planting them. This group is now, I think these were first graders. I think they're now in third grade. Um, so this year we got, to har or we got to harvest them. If you look right here, I have we, we brought the strawberries in and then I dehydrated them and made some fruit rolls for them. And they're not as sweet. And that's one of the things that we um, 
and our food sovereignty topics. Um, it's not as sweet as what you buy in the store. So the kids are like, this doesn't taste like fruit rolls. And one of the things that happens is um, during our colonization period and our food sovereignty was taken away from us, we were bombarded with foods that were good for us. And our, our tastes are different. We're not used to those tastes of tasting the natural food. We're used to tasting salt and sugar and preservatives and additives and instead of really tasting the um, natural food. So that's part of why I always um, try to um, give them samples of food that we have growing outside. And now our strawberries, this is our, um, our third year of the strawberries growing and they're really big plants and the kids take really good care of them because they, they have only stuff over them. And that's the first place they head when we take them out there. Are there strawberries out there? And they go right up until a hard frost. And so this is um, when we first got our, um, our medicine garden and we um, wear our outdoor costume here. So they, uh, we're going to want to talk about um, how that all got started when you went out there and Miss Hardy showed you the area where we were going to build. Yeah, um, you know, I when I went to apply for a job there, um, I put the concept of the outdoor classroom right on the table at my interview. And Mrs. Hardy took me out there um, to show me the area next to the bus barn. Um, before they were putting in the bus barn, that area had a variety of trees, cottonwoods, ash, um, but it also had morel mushrooms out there. That's how good that soil was. But when they put in the bus barn, um, they scraped all of that off and um, packed it down, hard packed it. And, and so um, it was a process trying to, to bring it back. Um, one of our students won a tree and, and a bench in a contest. Who was that through? Was that through the Center for Rural Affairs or who was doing that? Do you remember? It was a poster contest, I remember. Okay. We the a sapling of a maple tree in a mm -hmm. bench that goes. Yeah, and so they brought it, they planted it, but the, guard, the um, ground was so compacted that it failed to thrive. Um, so for, for us, as you can see, um, what Gonzay is there teaching them how to amend soil. We had a big pile of dirt, but it wasn't necessarily soil. So you want to talk to them about the process? So we, to test, to test that, to see how well things are gonna grow in there, you can see in that bottom right one, we planted beans in all the, just a few bean plants in each one. And some of them grew okay, and then some of them didn't grow very well. And so um, through one of our partners, uh, collaborative partners, uh, you are now um, a tribal extension office, they bought us, um, uh, what is the name? Uh, she's a horticulturist. She came up and she said, you know, the so they did soil samples for us. Kathleen Q. Yeah. yeah. And they, there was a lot of clay in that soil. And then so while we were digging through there, we, we would find all kinds of car parts, broken glass. And what we found out through um, learning about that area at one time in the 60s and early 70s, that was a landfill there. They were throwing trash in there. And so we, instead of like, you know, taking our heads, oh, this is no good or whatever, we turned it into a teaching moment and we, taught, we learned how to amend the soil. Um, we brought in lots of compost. We learned about composting. Um, we would go down to the river and um, we would get, I would get sand and buffalo manure. And then we brought in peat moss and vermiculite and perlite. And we would mix those together in big giant um, uh, containers, tubs, probably like 40 gallon tubs. And we would mix all of that stuff together and make a kind of like a homemade um, 
um, potting soil. And then you can see that's why the kids have the stubbles there. We would put that in there and we would mix it and mix it and mix it. We did that for a whole season. For all of fall, we did that the whole the whole time to see the kids kids in there working and mixing that soil together. And then uh, one of our teachers, Mr. Ariza, he would get the pillar and then they would just break that up. The perlite and the uh, micellite would help break that um, uh, clay down. And so it was a process. It didn't, you know, just it's not going to happen overnight working with this medicine garden. This is like four years in. And if you look there um, in the middle picture right there, it's um, this was last spring or last year, uh, 2021. Uh, we got some things growing in there. So it, and, and then we had to haul dirt. If you see the buckets right there, because these didn't have dirt inside of them or soil, we would go to a place where there was soil and we would fill all those buckets up and the kids would haul all that dirt that, and it was hard work. And that's, um, you know, but it was fun for them pulling that way. <laughs> for adults, it'd be hard work, but for, for kids, you know, it's fun. They want to play in the dirt. They want to shovel. They want to, you know, move that soil. And some of the students, they would say, you know, putting their hands in that soil, um, a lot of the kids would give us this comment that it was so satisfying to feel that. So they would have that reconnection to Mother Earth. It was a natural process, something that, would, you know, they probably would have done um, um, prior to our colonization era. Okay, and we go to the next one, we'll go next. Well, this is taken and and incorporated with our Dijinga Waganza, our little house of learning. Um, puppets have always been an important part of what we do. It's fun to do storytelling with them. And it's also fun for them to learn about the animals that we have. We have all animals that would be um, seen in Nebraska. Um, up in the corner, there's a book called Night Animals. And those are the characters that go along with that. And for the first time late last spring, um, the elders were able to translate that book into Umaha. So at some point when we have our puppet theater, we'll be able to um, teach kids how to use the puppets and use the language to do our first presentation all in Umaha. So that's exciting to look forward to. The teaching of Wagonza has a, a big rug in it. It has cedar benches. That's some of those are, are put up on the cedar benches. Um, but before we had that, we had our classroom and we had one student who suggested that we go on a road trip with them. So we lined up all the chairs and pretended we were a bus and I was the bus driver and, and we went different places. We would stop and get out. We went camping one time. We had a little campsite, you know, things like that. But always the animals were used in character of those animals. They weren't used as, you know, ninjas or anything like that. So, but it was still a lot of fun. Um, you want to add to that, Wagonze? Yeah, and it just gave the, the students the opportunity to be creative. When we first gave them the puppet, they were kind of like shy and vassal. You know, they didn't want to get in character. And some of them did go right into the, the you know, natural character of playing with those puppets. But it gave them a voice, you know, other than having to stand up and, you know, use their own voice. And it seemed like it, um, it gave them more of a comfort ability to be creative and um, be out of character into, into another character. And it was a lot of fun for them. Um, during COVID, we had to put the puppets away because we only have one set. Um, so we're hoping that soon we'll be able to start getting back to that again, where we can learn about these animals and, and their natural habitats and how they interact. And the night animals is a really good story. And I'm looking, we're looking forward to incorporating the Umaha language into this um, uh, component of our of our um, classroom. Go ahead. So this is our uh, seven acres planting land. 
um, through the generous donation of seeds from the Center for Rural Affairs, the students planted a wide variety of plants the spring of 2021. So what happened was, <laughs> this is a really good story. Um, Brenda and I asked for a little area of uh, where we could, you know, plant a small garden to keep gardening skills to be good for our food sovereignty and sustainability folks component. And um, we just happened to go, we were invited to Center for Rural Affairs to go to the Nebraska uh, Food Summit uh, down in Omaha. And lo and behold, a bunch of our community members were there that were, you know, part of um, the farming uh, for the Omaha tribe. And um, the director for at that time um, was there presenting. And so when we got back to Macy, I, I contacted him and I asked him if he would come and be a part of our collaboration, you know, and maybe give us some insight of, of planting a garden and what it is to be a farmer and working for the tribe and growing food. And we said we needed a place to um, plant a garden. And it just happened to be that year that um, right behind our football field, right south of our football field, um, seven acres was coming up for lease. And we just happened, and um, Brenda always says that when you conspire, um, the universe happened, the universe will open up and things, great things happen for you when you ask for help. Um, we were given that um, seven acres by the tribe to grow uh, a garden. And the, uh, the first year they uh, we planted uh, cucumbers, tomatoes, bell peppers, watermelon, cabbage, onions, beans, squash, sweet, sweet potatoes, potatoes, hot peppers, jalapenos, pumpkins, kale, Swiss chard, and eggplant. Um, and we collaborate with Center for Rural Affairs and we put in a Three Sisters garden. So all of these things are, um, we're teaching food sovereignty and that picture down there you see of the wagon and the kids. Um, if you go to the next slide, it tells about the, the, the how much we got out of there. Oh, before we even planted, um, we had our elders come and pray. Umaha culturally, they had a, um, a corn ceremony. They had a planting ceremony that was performed before they would even start planting. So we asked the elders, we went to the elders and we told them, you know, what we wanted to do and then that we wanted to do things in a culturally appropriate and relevant way. So our elders came, and um, this is a picture of them, and uh, Grandpa Rufus White prayed for us. And it was just, it was so, it was just like they just came. There was two eagles came from the east of the garden, and they came right over the top of us. And they were so close to us that you could hear hear them uh, with their, their um, calls that they, their chirping sounds that they make. And they... Took our, our prayers for us, and it's been <laughs> and there's been a lot of learning going on for our kids, where we have um, food disparity, lack of food, lack of healthy food. We are now uh, we finished successfully two years of growing down there on that land, and it's been a wonderful blessing for us. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to meet people that helped us do all these things. So the first harvest, um, they processed and dried over 50 quarts of Indian corn. And um, in our tier beds, we, we grew 41 quart, uh, we grew um, popcorn. So we had uh, Indian corn and we processed 41 quarts of popcorn. And you see our our maintenance even, our maintenance people even chipped in and helped. <laughs> Everybody got involved helping dry that corn. So that was our first year down there. Um, so let's see. Um, and we were able to give vegetables to the kitchen staff. Um, they gave them on the salad bar. The students harvested. 1,500 pounds of cucumbers, 250 
that went home with the kids. Yeah, yeah, because it was so much. And we gave to the um, commodity program that year, and we gave to the the elder uh, the elder the senior citizen center. So then, in the spirit of collaboration at Omaha Nation Public Schools, um, uh, the K through eight, and then we have a, something that's called the DAG program. And through the DAG program, um, we the uh, the administration. Uh, I sat. Um, I helped uh, the first year. They uh, wrote a grant to the um, Nebraska Department of Labor. Where we received, received um, $25,000. And then through the uh, Nebraska Voc Rehab, we received another um, $25,000 to pay students to work out in that garden through the summer months. And they're supervised by our dad teacher. His name is Mr. Ariza. He um, uh, teaches them job skills. Uh, and then also they, they have their, um, their, their uh, food initiatives also. Um, they're paid, the, the students, uh, I think there's there's 22 to 25 students that work out there, and they all receive $10 an hour through the summer months, and it's, uh, they uh, just finished uh, up their their second year out there of the students working and earning the wage. So we've been very fortunate um, in that perspective um, in uh, meeting the needs of our community. Uh, so these are our community partners, Center for Rural Affairs of Nebraska. Um, they, uh, we, we received two small mini grants from them and we use them to buy garden tools and supplies for our students working here in our, um, our um, little area. and then the Nebraska Vocational 